So, they just asked me this morning in Mangalarti when I was half asleep, <laughs> you want to MC? So I don't know who's supposed to talk or who's not. <laughs> I don't even, they didn't give me a list even. So, all right, we'll call Kusa Mataji, <laughs> Kusa Devi Dasi to come give us some memories of Srila Prabhupada. Thank you, Badri Narayan, for wonderful pastimes of Srila Prabhupada. You had us all so enlivened to hear how Srila Prabhupada could mesmerize and steal the hearts of even the non-devotees. So wonderful. So I only have a two-minute talk prepared because <laughs> that's what I meditated on, two minutes. But the thing that I really wanted to share is how Srila Prabhupada, he taught us what is the duty of a man who is about to die. And then he taught us how to live within the context of that most important question, what is the duty of a man who is about to die? So our life would be enlivened. He taught us that it doesn't matter if we live or if we die, because whatever we will be doing in this life, we will be doing in the next. We are doing devotional service. He taught us each and every so many detailed things of how to celebrate Krishna consciousness. We get up in the morning singing and dancing, at night singing and dancing, paying obeisances to all our God brothers and God sisters. It's just a festival of life. Prabhupada has given us the festival of life, one festivity after another, singing and dancing. Just like it says in the Brahma Samhita, they do not talk, they sing. They do not walk, they dance. And this is the life that Srila Prabhupada has blessed us all with. And I want to thank Srila Prabhupada on this 40th anniversary of his disappearance that he has given us such a wonderful life. And he is still with us, guiding us and protecting us through everything. Thank you, Srila Prabhupada. So we'd like to thank Kusa Mataji for a very wonderful offering. Uh, that we're here celebrating Srila Prabhupada's 40th anniversary of, how, of his disappearance and how Prabhupada has given us this way of life that is celebrating life. So, I don't have a list, so who wants to come? <laughs> Samik Rishi, would you like to speak something? So we'll invite our dear Samik Rishi Prabhu to please come and share some memories of Srila Prabhupada with us. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashyatya Deshatarine uh, Really I was not prepared, neither I was planning to speak, neither my name was there on the list, but I thought by hearing uh, Badri Narayan Maharaj that let me just speak few things. My uh, relation with Srila Prabhupada, although I am neither a senior person nor I had that much connection with Srila Prabhupada, but at least six, eight times I met Srila Prabhupada. First time was in 1972. Uh, April 1 that he was in New York so I went there and saw him and they called me uh, in the room so there was certain discussion but main point was that people ask why we cannot see Krishna why I cannot see Krishna but then Prabhupada answers that you should make yourself in such a way that Krishna sees you so we were in a Rathyatra in New York that was in 1975-76, first time New York Rathyatra on the uh, 5th Avenue. 
the biggest avenue or biggest street. So we were there in 75 I was in Philadelphia with Rath Yatra and uh, I attended that also. But Rila Prabhupada, I was looking at Prabhupada that why people worship him as, as, as if he is the supreme personality, as he is God. So I was looking at him and he was staring at me and it continued for quite long time, almost like five minutes or more. And I was amazed that why he is looking at me. But just like, like say, Krishna or wherever say Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he went Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to see one washerman. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu goes across a river and washerman was amazed why he is coming, he must be bagging some clothes or something. Uh, but just by, he says just, Hari Bol, or, so that person, he started singing, dancing and then whoever saw this man, his wife and whole uh, township, they all became devotees. So same thing Prabhupada, wherever he went, whether he went for few minutes or few days, like in Russia, he went for three days. And he converted, now you see, there are so many temples, there are so many amazing devotees are coming. So, wherever city, place he came, wherever he is breathing, just like the cows they breathe, that place becomes auspicious. Uh, so, same thing, Srila Prabhupada also, uh, his Shaktavashya's avatar, by hundreds of evidences, are there for being him uh, empowered, uh, personality of Godhead. So, same thing Prabhupada is also that I experienced that that transformed my life. Initially, I was doubting whether I should take initiation from him, although I was in the movement since almost 71. But it took me many years uh, to get convinced that he is the real guru. I should take initiation because uh, I saw many bogus gurus. I come from a Vaishnava family and I saw many sadhus and they are all later on knowing that they have so much motives and they want to cheat you, take advantage of you but here is the person that I can depend on him, I can surrender to him so I did take initiation from him in 1977 uh, but he has so many amazing things about Srila Prabhupada that I came across or I knew so when I saw him in New York City then I asked him some questions, they took me devotees, they escorted me to the room because there were very few Indian devotees at that time. Uh, so, whenever there are some Indian people came, they, the devotees, they took us to his room. So, I was there and uh, some another uh, devotee were there. And Prabhupada asked the names, where we come from, what we are doing. And uh, my question was that, people asked that, why? My mind goes here and there, so many places, uh, while chanting, how to control the mind. And Srila Prabhupada's answer was that you try to focus on the sound, just go on chanting and your mind would automatically be controlled by the power of the holy name. So holy name can purify whatever contamination are there and it is natural that mind would go because of our association with our so many thoughts, so many lifetimes, millions of lifetimes that we have been thinking of enjoying our senses. But his answer was very, very clear that you focus, go on chanting and mind would be controlled. There is no extraneous activity that you have to do to control mind, although you have to follow the regulatory principles, try to deliberately focus your mind on chanting. And that was very clear and that helped me a lot in uh, focusing on chanting. So another question, there was someone, another devotee, I am forgetting his name, but he saw he was married to a, uh, another young American woman, an Indian Punjabi man, being married to a uh, American woman and so they all came to get blessings from Srila Prabhupada. So Srila Prabhupada said that it's alright, we are the spirit soul. If the relation depends for Krishna, if both are serving Krishna together, then it doesn't matter what nationality, what color, what they are, it doesn't matter if the activity is to serve, uh, serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So in that way he clarified many people have doubts whether we should astrologically or that is different thing but whether national marriage, international marriage, caste system, he just cleared that as long as both are practicing Krishna consciousness and serving Krishna together like the two tracks of the rail then, then it's a 
it's it's all right one don't have to consider so he blessed this couple and uh, so we all came out but also like uh, i had my first son was born in 1973 and shila prabhupada i came to new york city to so get him blessed so we put him at his lotus feet uh, and he said baba ka naam kya hai he said its name is sarvesh please bless him so that way is dust from the lotus feet of the uh, shila prabhupada his remnants water that is washing so it's all purifying wherever he walks wherever he went he goes they are all uh, just like same importance is the supreme personality of godhead one should take that so i am very thankful to shila prabhupad that not only he gave me initiation he looked at me and infused whatever is looking uh, is not ordinary if he looks if he talks if he touches if he uh, take his remnants if he speak with him or he gives even if he chastises that's also the same thing like jagdananda and sanatan goswami so chaitanya mahaprabhu would chastise jagdananda but would praise sanatan goswami and sanatan goswami was always lamenting why he is chastising jagdananda and uh, praising me in such highly so he told that uh, that chaitanya mahaprabhu is so much close to jagdananda uh, because he considers his own person and that's why he can he can chastise so prabhupada's chastisement is also like that that if he is chastising that should be taken as an uh, very much intimacy that prabhupada likes him he is blessing him and that's the intimacy so whether krishna is killing or he is uh, giving you long life it doesn't matter uh, same thing if shri prabhupada is also whether he is chastising someone or whether he is loving someone talking someone giving some gift doesn't matter uh, whatever a uh, personality like shila prabhupad is doing they are all transcendental his body is transcendental his words are transcendental because like the iron rod in the fire becomes all fiery or it is like a touch stone so whether touch stone touches a rotten iron it turns it into gold same thing prabhupad wherever he touched he made uh, everything like a gem like a gold so on this day of shila prabhupad's 40th disappearance a day where there is appearance or disappearance they are same they continue uh, in another planet another planet to help uh, lord krishna in his movement or spread krishna consciousness so i just pray to him on this day that he gives me a strength uh, to serve him purely to serve his mission of spreading krishna consciousness uh, prabhupada also like he did like chetane mahapur predicted every town and village my name will be spread and sushila prabhupad did so much uh, background work or so much work and if i could continue in fulfilling his mission in spreading krishna consciousness village in villages because i come from a village i made a trust by name every town and village hari krishna in every town and village trust that i am building a temple and i pray to him to fulfill uh my desire to spread krishna consciousness in uh, village as many as possible uh, small villages and towns thank you shila prabhupad for giving me the opportunity and accepting me as your disciple and thank you dinbandhu prabhu for giving me opportunity to speak hari krishna hi to shall i call next devi shakti yes so we'd like to thank uh his grace samagrishi for some wonderful memories and showing us the power of prabhupada's glance uh in india they always say when they meet us out of kripa drishti that you just look at me with with uh, mercy hmm so prabhupada's glance was so powerful that our samik rishi became a devotee even though he was a big doubter having seen so many bogus gurus before so next i'd like to call her grace devi shakti devi dasi who's been here in Vrindavan even longer than me and she has so many wonderful memories of Srila Prabhupada and keeps Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunivari Paschatya Desha Tarine Srila Prabhupada is so merciful Uh, when Srila Prabhupada began ISKCON, 
Of course, now we're very well established in India. But when Prabhupada went to the West um, and his 5,000 disciples, practically 97% of them were Westerners. And Westerners generally meant they were mleches. And mlecha meant we knew absolutely nothing about Krishna. Never heard Krishna's name. Didn't have a clue who Krishna was. We only knew one person and that was Srila Prabhupada. And each of his disciples uh, completely surrendered themselves to Srila Prabhupada. I think everyone will agree to that. That our surrender was to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada taught us everything about Krishna consciousness. He gave us lifestyle. He um, gave us life. And because we love Srila Prabhupada so much, we did whatever he asked us to do to help spread Krishna consciousness. Uh, yes, we used our intelligence, but our, we used our intelligence so far as the instructions Prabhupada gave us, we just tried to figure out how to follow those instructions. So, because we had fully surrendered to Prabhupada when we took initiation, um, it meant there was a, a culture, cultural change, a shift. And many of the devotees, uh, you might have heard about that there was brainwashing and there were court cases and the parents tried to stop the devotees from becoming, the children from becoming devotees. So I came from such a family. And when I became a devotee, uh, my parents completely cut me off from the family. Legally, disinherited me. That how dare she become, what is this? We've never seen such a thing. They couldn't understand what Krishna consciousness was. And worse than that, uh, the temple got me married. And the marriage was the final, the final straw. They would have nothing further to do with me. And after that, the marriage failed and the husband deserted me. So then I was a little kid, no family, no husband. I only had Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada knew that. And he took such good care of me throughout my whole Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada would give me instructions. Um, they were very heavy instructions. Somehow or other, uh, Prabhupada believed that um, I could do things that he wanted get, to get done. And he would call me sometimes and give me instructions. He would tell me uh, he wanted his books distributed in Mayapur and Vrindavan, he told me I should see that his books are stocked and distributed in Mayapur and Vrindavan, that temples hadn't been built yet. Uh, he told me that he wanted his books put in all the schools and libraries in India. Uh, he told me he wanted his books put in the embassies all over India. There were embassies in Bombay, Delhi, and Calcutta. Uh, he told me he wanted me to collect for Mayapur and Vrindavan. And when Prabhupada would ask me to do things, um, they became the, the whole purpose of my life. And I would always worry how to get these things done for Prabhupada. And then at one point, Prabhupada had me live with his saintly sister, Pishima. And for three months I lived with her and served her as best I could. She was just like a thunderbolt, just like Srila Prabhupada. But being the female, uh, you can say a female version of Srila Prabhupada, from her I learned how to uh, learn the feminine aspect of Krishna consciousness because we only knew Srila Prabhupada. So she taught me, uh, specifically she taught me how to cook for Prabhupada, the way Prabhupada liked, Bengali style. And for three months, I trained under her. And then after three months, Prabhupada called me. And he said, uh, now you've learned sufficiently. I want you to modify and let my sister rest. So Prabhupada, he, he had me trained by his sister how to cook. And then, uh, so I had, here in Vrindavan, I had 
huge, uh, such, not burden, but such crushing instructions that Prabhupada had given me to do. He wanted, he told me to lecture, he told me to learn Hindi. This isn't bragging, this is, this is heavy responsibilities that I, I couldn't figure out how to, how to execute. So when uh, Prabhupada became ill in 1977, uh, I was here in Vrindavan. We were all expecting Srila Prabhupada to come for the Mayapur Vrindavan festival. So we were getting Prabhupada's house ready for him and um, suddenly we got the message that Prabhupada couldn't come, he was too sick. And I could understand then that uh, this was going to be the end for Srila Prabhupada, it was just a matter of time. And for me it was the end of my life when I couldn't serve Prabhupada anymore. And it was a very, very traumatic time in my life, I'm sure in all the disciples' lives, but I'm just, I have to talk for myself because I don't know how other people were thinking. So, uh, Prabhupada understood that, and when he finally came to Vrindavan, some months later, he came in May, uh, he called me, <coughs> and he gave me some final instructions. This would be the last instructions that, Prabh that I received from Srila Prabhupada. And um, he, Prabhupada was very sick at the time. He hadn't eaten for months. And when he called me, he was upstairs in his upper room, his private room. And Tamal Krishmaraj was there. I don't know who else was there because Tamal Krishmaraj was standing right behind Prabhupada. So Prabhupada, he, after I offered my obeisances to Prabhupada and was sitting at his feet, he very gravely said to me, he said, you should stay in our camp. You should not leave us. He said, you used to be my cook. You were a good cook. Uh, just now I'm not eating, but when I feel better, you can cook for me. And then he explained that, um, Tamal Krishmaraj explained, that Prabhupada felt that he was rotting here in Vrindavan because he was just sitting and his health was so poor. And he felt that if he went out to preach again, then his health would improve. This was Prabhupada's idea of how to get better from his sickness. So within a few days, Prabhupada had planned to leave. So Prabhupada, he told me at that time, he said, I'm going and you should go there immediately so that I could cook for him when he was feeling better. So Prabhupada's ticket was booked for London and I had to arrange a ticket within a few days. The only ticket I was able to get was straight to New York City. So Prabhupada flew to London and I flew to New York City. I was getting his rooms already there and getting ready to cook for Prabhupada, hoping he would be able to eat by then. And then the terrible news came that Prabhupada was too sick to come to New York and he had turned around and he was going to Bombay and then on to Vrindavan. He wanted to see that his Bombay temple was complete before he left. So for me that was completely crushing and in those days it was very difficult uh, for Americans to get visas because relations between America and India were quite... Uh, India at that time was pro-Russian and America was pro-Pakistani. So uh, you had to wait a certain number of months before you can get another visa to come back. So due to my greatest misfortune, I couldn't be here when Srila Prabhupada disappeared. But as soon as I could get my visa to come back, I immediately rushed back here and did what I had always been doing for Srila Prabhupada, I started to take care of his house again because the house had been all closed up after Srila Prabhupada left. And I remembered all the instructions Prabhupada had given me. Don't leave, stay here. He, he, so many things, a whole lifetime, many lifetimes of things Prabhupada asked me to do. And I knew that now I had to get all those things done. So Prabhupada's house at that time was completely closed up. 
I would just go there every day. I would worship Prabhupada. If any of Prabhupada's disciples came, they would come in. They would remember Prabhupada, their times with him. They would cry or they would remember, you know, speak about Prabhupada. But it was a completely private home, just as it was when Prabhupada lived, lived here. Uh, but then uh, in 1979, we got a new GBC, who was Bhavananda, who was a very powerful personality. He was GBC for both Mayapur and Vrindavan. And he decided that we should share Srila Prabhupada with everyone who comes to the temple. I was opposed to that because I knew that the devotees needed this sacred place to be alone with Prabhupada. But Bhavananda decided, no, we're going to make Prabhupada's house into a museum. So Tamal Krishna Maharaj at that time, I meant to bring it, I forgot. He gave me Prabhupada's key. Now Prabhupada always carried this key on his Brahmin thread, wherever he went. You could always see the key on his Brahmin thread. And this key was to Prabhupada's Elmira in his bedroom. And what Tamal Krishna Maharaj had done was after Prabhupada disappeared, he divided all of Prabhupada's personal belongings into three. He sent one, he took one set to Bombay, kept it in the rooms there. He sent one set with Bhavananda to Mayapur, and he kept one set locked up in Prabhupada's Elmira in Vrindavan. So nobody knew what was inside the Elmira except for Tamal Krishna Maharaj. So we opened up Prabhupada's Elmira and we saw all the wonderful things that Prabhupada had kept here. And we figured out how we could display these things safely. And then Bhavananda, because at that time Mayapur had just been attacked for the second time. They stole Srimati Radharani, they stole uh, Sri Gadadhar, the Shalagram Maharaj there. So Bhavananda decided that he couldn't, he didn't want to take the risk of keeping Prabhupada's things in Mayapur anymore. So he brought all of Prabhupada's things from Mayapur to Vrindavan also. So then we had a treasure of Prabhupada's tadiyanam, all of Prabhupada's personal belongings. And we set up Prabhupada's house very carefully. And in order to keep Prabhupada amongst us, uh, we made it into a living temple. We had Prabhupada on his whole daily schedule of what he did from one o'clock in the morning when he woke up, we would set up his uh, his translating table, we'd put a mosquito net over his table, we'd have his beds all ready, we'd have his sweets there and his medicine bottle, everything exactly as Prabhupada lived. We set up Prabhupada's house and everything he did at the exact times, we did all of that, his cooking, his bathing, we'd heat up his water, we'd put out his mat. And in that way, when you walked into Prabhupada's house in those days, it was just as if Prabhupada was in the other room because everything was going on as when Prabhupada was physically present. Then things changed a bit. Uh, GBC changed, hands changed, this and that, the other thing. And um, I became busy in doing all those things that Prabhupada asked me to do, particularly the book distribution and the collection. So, as I became busy in those activities, Prabhupada's house went into the hands of uh, Nishinga Devi. She looked after Prabhupada's house for 20 years. And when she went back to Godhead, Prabhupada took her back for all that service. Uh, then in the hands of Adi Prabhu, and now in the most uh, competent hands of uh, Dharmatma Prabhu. He's brought Prabhupada's house up to such a beautiful standard. Again, you can feel that presence of Srila Prabhupada, the cleanliness, the brahmacharis doing everything, serving Prabhupada. So Prabhupada's house is in a, I feel, in a wonderful state where you go in and you just feel Prabhupada there. And in the meantime, I'm continuing trying to fulfill those uh, instructions that Prabhupada gave me. A few days ago, uh, someone called me up and they said, uh, they said, my friend just Googled you. Now, I'd never heard of that before. It sounded decadent. I didn't, you know, how do you get Googled? <laughs> so I said, well, what does that mean, you know, <laughs> when you Google somebody? So they said, well, they looked you up on Google. 
I said, well, I'm not on Google. I, you know, I have Wincom. They said, no, 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 you're there, you're there. So I, I Googled myself. I said, what? What's this Google? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I typed in my name and I saw oh, all these videos and all these things I never knew existed even. <laughs> so I turned on one little video and uh, I, saw my, I saw my face. <laughs> you know, nobody looks at their face when you're a devotee. You just put your T-lock on and it's over. That's it. You have a little mirror. I saw my face. Oh, look at that old woman. She's got wrinkles all over the place. I'd seen myself after, you know, 47 years. <laughs> and then I realized, yes, I can identify every single wrinkle on my face. <laughs> this is the wrinkle for collecting donations from Mayapur and Vrindavan. And this is the wrinkle for stocking and distributing Prabhupada's books. And this is the wrinkle for learning Hindi. And this is a wrinkle for lecturing. I just, I knew, I knew every single wrinkle on my face. And I realized this is a wonderful life. Prabhupada has given us such a nice life. I'm getting old and wrinkled. And I'm just engaged, I'm just worrying all the time how I can fulfill those instructions that Prabhupada gave me. So I beg for your mercy. I'm sorry I talked about myself. I wanted to talk about Prabhupada more, but it's in relation. And there's a beautiful prayer that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he spoke. It's a, a, an explanation of the end of Sikshastakam. He says, Krishna Morda Jivan, Krishna Morda Pranadan, Krishna Morda Pranera Paran, Hridaye Upare Dharan, Seva Kori Suki Karan, E Morda Sada Rahe Dhyan. So this is Lord Chaitanya's prayer. For him, Krishna is everything. But we who, we don't have a clue who, who Lord Chaitanya is, who Krishna is. So for me, the translation is, Prabhupada is my life and soul. Prabhupada is the treasure of my life. Indeed, Prabhupada is the very life of my life. I therefore keep him always in my heart and try to please him by rendering service. That is my constant meditation. Jai. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. So we'd like to thank Devi Shakti Devi Dasi for giving us a very wonderful, intricate history of Srila Prabhupada's house. We never knew all these things before. And wonderful history of her own life. Oh, I was just thinking about him. So we have very another wonderful god brother named uh, Vani Nath Vasu, who stays now in, in uh, Gainesville, Florida, not far from New Raman Reti. Krishna. Ogler Srila Prabhupada. This... Uh, this pastime has a name. It's called uh, Srila Prabhupada's Big Black Man. <laughs> okay. So, 1976, uh, uh, many of you remember the Rathiatra in New York. Huge. So, it's in relationship to that. So I was a fairly new devotee, joined in Gainesville, Florida, and that's where I currently live. And I was doing traveling Sankirtan book distribution with a god brother, Jagannath Tirtha. And we traveled to New York um, doing Sankirtan. And we stopped in Charlotte, North Carolina, where another god brother, Gaudi, and his wife at the time, Tatiksha, um, Paramatma, and a a Native American devotee, Hayawata, I think it was, he wasn't initiated. They had a, a center in Charlotte, North Carolina. So we stopped in, and for those of you who don't know Charlotte, North Carolina, it is the southeastern United uh, States is known somewhat as the Bible Belt of the United States. You have a lot of, the type of Christianity that you find there is uh, kind of the in-your-face kind of Christianity and, um, yeah, you know, the wa wash in the blood, and I don't know if you've heard these terms before, but this is part <laughs> of the vernacular, and, and they are a little uh, fanatical. So that's Charlotte, North Carolina. So 
giving the class, Gaudi gave class that morning, and he was talking about an experience in, on Sankirtan they had had where he had encountered three of these persons at a mall. He was there distributing books, he was by himself, and he had encountered these persons. And he had, and if you have a dealing with them, um, you can almost feel when their envy is coming up. They, it's hard for them to reconcile any other spiritual practice with their own spiritual practice. So he mentioned how he had warned them once in the course of their discussing. He was inside his, the van and they were outside the window talking with him, three of them. So he warned them once, twice, and then the third time they just went off and et cetera and it just you know, began saying many offensive things. So he described how he jumped out of the van and promptly chased all three of them around the mall there in Charlotte. <laughs> so, it, and we were having a class from the Nectar of Devotion. Now in the Nectar of Devotion, there's a prescription given about what to do with person, you know, if you're in a situation where you hear blasphemy. Um, one is to leave the place, one is also to defeat them with philosophical arguments, and another prescription is to cut their tongue out <laughs> of the offender. <laughs> So, uh, I guess he was ch choosing or attempting to do the latter <laughs> and in his chasing these persons around the mall. So I would made note of all of this at that time I, for Bhagavatam class, I was, uh, I was a kind of fanatical note taker and I was taking notes of it, so you know, cut their tongue out, you know, so. <laughs> okay, so fast forward, we go to New York and actually there's, there's a little preface to that, but I'll get to the big black man story. That morning, um, actually, uh, another thing that was mentioned also, I forget who it was on yesterday, mentioned the number of devotees who had come for Caracas, Venezuela. And I remember in the, in the temple room that morning, they asked, they were, we were, they were doing a survey just to get an idea of where the number of devotees were. Caracas, Venezuela had the most number of devotees there. There were devotees from all over the United States and all over the world. Caracas and second was Gainesville in terms of number of devotees. So we were well represented. So they asked for volunteers in the morning to move the cart from the construction site to where the parade would begin. So I volunteered to go out with a number of other uh, men to pull the cart to where the site was. So I show up, ask what can I do? I, I was given the ropes for the cart. The ropes that they had for pulling the carts were these thick ropes. I think they were probably used probably for, for uh, ships, for docking ships. That's the size ropes they were. So there are two coils. One devotee gave them to me. And I can tell by his concern, by his um, lecture, that he was going to be coming back to see if I put them down. He's told me, because New York streets are are kind of like the streets here. Um, you know, just there's a lot of things on the street. So he didn't want to put the, the ropes down because they would get dirty, and these were the ropes that the crowd would pull uh, Lord Jagannath. So I was holding the ropes as instructed, and I don't think I even moved my feet. I knew he was going to come back. He, he, it was just the, the nature of how he had instructed me. So sure enough, he comes back maybe five, ten minutes later, and somehow there's something on the ropes. I hadn't put them down. I, I'm very clear about that. And so this devotee from New York, just he gives me the whole Bhagavatam, just up and down, nonsense, <laughs> meditating on sense gratification, you know, false devotee, blah, 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 just up and down, sideways, etc. <laughs> and, um, and you probably notice I'm actually a little tall. So in the USA, black body, male, six feet, uh, people usually give me my space, you know, whenever I go places, etc. This devotee was all up like he was like doing a dental exam or something. So he was just really, he really gave me the, the sauce, so as we say, it, it used to say in those days. So, okay, so he presently leaves and I'm just more or less just kind of recuperating from this uh, experience. And then all of a sudden I hear, Prabhupada's coming. And as, um, as was the ha Prabhupada's habit, he would go on a morning walk and the devotees would take him out in a car to either a park or a seaside, etc. So 
While in New York, apparently they, the, um, they had decided to come by and check on the construction site. So the car came in, pulled up to the front of the cart where I was at the, at the back of the cart. I was at the front holding the ropes. So the car went there, everyone dropped everything. I think I was the only person standing just there. I was just by myself. And everyone went there. And, and I was thinking, okay, should I put these ropes down? Uh, and I was thinking, well, if I put these ropes down and that devotee comes back, there may be some altercation or something. I, I didn't know what to do. So I was on the mental platform. I think it was a relatively short period of time that Prabhupada was at the front of the cart. I mean, at the back of the car. But, be honest, I don't remember. I, I was just kind of back and forth. Should I go? Should I stay? Should I go? Should I go? stay? So finally, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually go. But, so presently the car pulled her out and around and came back up towards the, the uh, front of the car. And Srila Prabhupada was on the side where you can see me. I still didn't put the ropes down and offer obeisances. I offered whatever I could standing up. And, and um, the, the picture in my mind that I have, uh, Srila Prabhupada seeing me, was kind of like a kind of a curiosity, like, oh, what is this? Is this a scarecrow or what? <laughs> you know, because in India, I remember this in Mayapur, uh, not now, but previously when I was here first in 1988, there, there was a field next to the parking lot. And there was a young boy that would spend his time, and he was like a human scarecrow. That's what he did all day. He was just out in the field, um, keeping animals and perhaps birds away uh, from the field. So it, maybe, I don't know, it just looked like you know, the, the expression on Srila Prabhupada's face was somewhat of a little surprise, like, what is this? Uh, that type of thing, what is this? So, okay, so... After that experience, then the Rathiatra parade starts on Fifth Avenue. And we, ha we had the entire Fifth Avenue, which I don't know if... How many devotees were actually there at uh, 76 Rathiatra? Any? Any? No? Samik <laughs> Rishi. Huh? Just, oh my gosh. Oh, I, I, I was expecting that everyone would know. F well, Fifth Avenue... I'm, we know Fifth Avenue. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to to, to imagine how explain how wide Fifth Avenue is, and we just, we had the whole thing. Uh, Fifth Avenue is like the street in the city, and we had it in and and we had it going on. I mean, it was just like so powerful. Um, it was such an amazing experience, and uh, and there were also some some opposition. There were some Christians that were kind of along the sidewalks. They couldn't really do anything as far as, it was like drops of water against the Himalayas or something. I mean, the, the kirtan was going on, huge crowd, and it, it was just a transcendental experience and um, Prabhupada being there. I was actually on the, on the cart with uh, Jainanda. Mm -hmm. he, was, and he was in the front and I was in charge of the braking. So we were communicating underneath the cart. So, a little back note on the, before I get to the next part of this, this uh, situation. The night before, the, uh, the Vaikuntha players had performed a play for Srila Prabhupada called The Age of Kali. It was so excellently done. I, it was riveted in my mind. And they were going to perform the same play again uh, for, at the festival site. So once I got to the festival site with the cart, I got to the front of the stage and I have to be honest, not so that I could hear Prabhupada, but I wanted to see that play again, just really, really up close. So the play finished, and Srila Prabhupada was started to speak. And you can find the tape of this lecture in, in New York. And it's the, the, the whole tape is, I think, less than a minute, minute and a half. Because about 15 seconds into Srila Prabhupada speaking, one of these Christians got up on a, a fountain wall and just started with all this spewing all this nonsense. Completely offensive. So I was all the way at the front, like the stage is here, I'm just standing here. And I didn't think about this. Oh, I should actually give a disclaimer at this point. Do not try this at home. This is, <laughs> viewer, listener discretion is advised. Your results will probably be different. So I take no responsibility, okay? <laughs> so 
when I heard this, I don't remember anything that the person said, but I just understood it was offensive. I took off running through the crowd towards this sound. I didn't know where the sound exactly was coming from. And, it, and, the, and I remember, okay, it was a, you know, a lot of devotees, a lot of guests, etc. So I was just kind of weaving through the crowd as I was running. And I was honing in on where the sound was coming from, kind of like a like maybe like a heat-seeking missile. I was moving this way, that way, et cetera. <laughs> and finally, I had a lock on the person. And they were, as I said, the Washington Square Park, are you familiar? Yeah. There's a fountain, right? Yeah. And there's a wall there. So he was on the wall and spewing whatever, whatever. And I saw him, and I came up, and he had this mic up like this, and I hit him just about right here. <laughs> and he goes back, it was, you know, like one of those, those slow motion scenes, back, back, up, 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 kadoosh, into the, into the fountain. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's exactly what the crowd did. You can hear it on the tape. The Prabhupada was actually interrupted. He stopped speaking. And when this happened, the crowd clapped. You heard everyone clap. And so, <laughs> and Haribo! <laughs> and so, I also remember as, so that was there, and I was kind of a little pacified. I, I, I don't know I, when I've ever been that angry before, because I remember one of the New York, like, Bohemian says, you know, just be cool, man. I said, I should have cut his tongue out. And I remember the, the, the eyes of the person when I told him that, that I, I just quickly said that, you know, I should have cut his tongue out. He was like, wow. You know, like, his eyes got really big as a response to my saying that. So the point was, though, from Srila Prabhupada's vantage point on the stage, he saw the whole scene. And there was Sudama Maharaj, and also then later Shutakirt, I mean, yes, um, Hari Sari recorded it in his book that later that evening in Prabhupada's room, Prabhupada made a comment to, um, to Hari Sari. Did you see that big black man? <laughs> so I was Srila Prabhupada's big black man. And in, in fact, I need to get my t-shirt made. It's a singular Srila Prabhupada's big black man. So uh, just one pastime like that with Srila Prabhupada. The service that I did for Srila Prabhupada was in the area of book distribution and college preaching. Uh, services that I hope to continue on to today. I got some... Uh, it's, is, uh, no, he's not there. The, the devotee who's doing the uh, Arabic printing, uh, I forget his name right now. Satyanarayan. Satyanarayan. Oh, yes. That was, I had a discussion with him and it was just like so enlivening. So I'm praying to all the Vaishnavas and to Srila Prabhupada to bless me that I might revive some of that opportunity in book distribution, even in this old age. It, it sounded like something that I could do. And uh, I have some ideas, something, some things that have come up. And also that I might be engaged in the Krishna House, which is doing a wonderful war, uh, job of distributing prasadam, training persons in Krishna consciousness, and giving everyone a wonderful impression of Krishna consciousness from the very start. So on the occasion of Srila Prabhupada's disappearance, I'm so blessed to be here amongst everyone. It's been quite a, a transcendental treat. The last time I was here was in 1996. And I hope not to, to be gone that long ever again. So thank you for your time. Srila Prabhupada Ki! Jai! So we'd like to thank Vaninath Vasu for his wonderful story, Prabhupada's big black man. <laughs> and I can't wait to see the t-shirt. <laughs> so just like Hanuman, we can use anger also in the service of the Lord. <laughs> So next I'd like to call an old Brishvasi who's come all the way from Los Angeles, Vidya Mataji. She, she was, when I first got here to Vrindavan, she was already here. And she's old Brishvasini. So we'd like to hear some of her memories of Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan. Hare Krishna. Namo 
Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pristaya, Bhutale, Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Dinamine, Namaste, Sarasvati Deve, Gauravani Bacharine, Nervisesha Sunyavari Paschacha Desitarine. I think I've been asked to speak because I happen to be present at Prabhupada's passing. So um, I'll tell you as much as I can about that experience, which I feel very fortunate to have been uh, a part of. Um, I think the first thing that you, you need to understand is that none of us really thought that Prabhupada was going to leave. Somehow, being present with the Shaktivesha avatar and his incredible transcendental uh, presence and his incredible transcendental powers uh, were just, we just, I think we all thought that he would also be able to transcend death as well and that he wasn't going to leave us, particularly because I think we all felt like neophytes and very young, like his young children and not really ready for him to leave. So he was sick and then not sick and then he would get, and then we would hear he was sick again and then he would get better. And of course we all thought personally that if we just were more Krishna conscious that that would keep him uh, present on the planet and that we just needed to correct ourselves and become better devotees and then he would stay with us longer. So that was sort of the mood of everyone here in Vrindavan, you know, as he was here and he would come out every day and, uh, you know, he was very weak so he, they would bring him out and um, mostly in his rocking chair and four different devotees would carry him out and they would come into the temple and Prabhupada would take darshan of all three altars and they would carry him from altar to altar and there was always a, a bit of sadness in the kirtan because we didn't like to see Srila Prabhupada not in his you know strongest form he would sit under the tamal tree in the rocking chair and Sachidananda um, Prabhu had tiny little cartels and he would lead these, these most beautiful uh, kirtans, very quiet kirtans. And a Gurukula boy or two would dance for Prabhupada. And Prabhupada would sometimes tap his fingers on the rocking chair and sometimes he would just hold his hands in pranams. You know, sometimes Indian guests would come and offer rupees to his feet and he would be very obliging and um, acknowledge them. And it was as if he was helping us to understand how to communicate with him when he was no longer in his, uh, in his, in his body, in his vapu form. And so he would give class, it would be without words that he would give these classes. And you would sit and be just as transposed as if he were speaking to you because in your heart you would hear so many instructions that he was giving to you at that time. So as days went by, he would come out and not even take darshan of the, I mean, he would take darshan of the deities and then he would circumambulate the temple. Soon he was just on a palanquin, he couldn't even really sit in the rocking chair and although it was obvious what was going on, none of us really wanted to accept that this, these were his last pastimes that we were going to be part of. And so he would circumambulate the temple and I think sometimes you must see pictures sometimes of how thin and frail he was at those times, but still translating and still, you know, giving us darshan and instructions continuously and caring as Davi Shakti so aptly displayed caring for each person individually and their Krishna consciousness. And so everyone was doing their service you know, as fast and as hard as they could to try and, and get Prabhupada to decide to stay. He'd been to London and then he returned and this all sort of transpired at that point. And so one day everyone was doing their service and the announcement came that Prabhupada was going to, that Kaviraj had said that Prabhupada would leave his body that day and that we should all come to the temple. So everyone dropped everything. Uh, some of us were in Tapuria house, some of us were, you know, distributing books, some of us were making prasadam, pudaris were there, so many devotees, and we all dropped everything to come uh, to Prabhupada's house. And there was kirtan going on, and people were massaging Prabhupada. And 
the house was really, really full, and it was a very hot day, even though it was November. It was unseasonably hot uh, for that time of year. And, uh, it, and then it was as if Krishna was arranging the, the, even the weather to suit his pure devotee so that he would not suffer uh, so much. And so the hours went by and the kirtan went on and so many hours went by, people needed water, they were a little hungry, they thought maybe they should shower and come from, you know, Arti. And basically, at least in my mind, I was thinking, oh, he's just enhancing our love for him and our connection with him. He's not actually going to leave. And I think pretty much everyone felt the same way because a lot of people left his house and then just a few people came back in, uh, you know, around the time for the Arctic. I know my husband and I stood at the gate and we said, um, do you think we should go to Sundar Arctic or shall we go to Prophet's house? And luckily we chose to go to Prophet's house so we were actually present for when he left. And so very soon after that, because he left, I think it's 725, uh, the Kirtan was going on. There were many devotees, maybe 30 devotees in the room. Um, I was still thinking he wasn't going to leave and I was sitting by the fireplace sewing on a Tulsi skirt. And then all of a sudden the kirtan became very, very loud and very, very transcendental. And, every, and then everyone jumped up and surrounded Prabhupada's bed. And as we were chanting, our, the voices that we heard were not even our voices. It was as if you felt the presence of maybe the, perhaps the demigods, but certainly per, spiritual personalities in the room. And the voices were just unbelievably beautiful. It was this incredible sound. And I, I remember thinking, and my voice sounds like that too, you know, and it was as if it, it, the, the, the whole vibration in the room was so high. And, and, and you felt as if you were at least two or three feet off the ground. And you felt as if you moved with Prabhupada's soul. As he left this body, you felt as if you were allowed to move with him for at least a short distance and then he was gone and it was like clunk and we were back in the here in the material world with many instructions of ways to further his movement and to further the, the mission of Lord Chaitanya which Prophet came um, to help us with and then we sat we, we went to the temple room they brought Prophet in on a palanquin, he sat on the Vyasasan for the last time. We all got to make an offering to him. And at one point, when, uh, oh, and a very interesting thing happened. It became bitter cold that night. So we'd all, you know, just had on summer clothes, summer saris, and all of a sudden the weather became like ice cold. It was sort of like, okay, here we are. And these are the realities of the world. And, um, and, and so we got to make our last offering. And at one point I got to stand up near the jolly, you know, the jolly right beside Prabhupada. And I was like looking through the jolly and I was sort of saying in my heart, look, Prabhupada, I'm standing right beside you. I can't believe it. And, he's, and it was like he said, so? And I said, well, we never got to do this before. You know, this is amazing that, you know, little me gets to stand so close. And he said, but you, were all, you could always be close to me. I said, no, no, there were always all those big devotees. And he said, they are never in your way. So like that, you, you have access to Prabhupada. And he was so, um, it was so obvious and he was so kind that he um, reassured me and reassured all of you that any time you think of him, he's with you. So... There were, there's a one billion, three hundred million lifetimes. L Lord Krishna advents himself in his original form here in Vrindavan. That was only 5,000 years ago when the yugas changed. <coughs> and then 500 years ago, this, in the same yuga, Lord Chaitanya only comes every one billion, three hundred million years. And that was only 500 years ago. And he came to advent the 10,000 year golden age of spirituality, of religiosity. And that was only 5, 500 years ago. And then just 
very fortunately only 40 years ago, Srila Prabhupada was still with us. The Shaktivesha avatar, there's so few that have come on the earth when and Krishna, if he doesn't advent himself, he sends his qualified devotee. And so he sent us Srila Prabhupada. So how fortunate are we souls who have come only 5,000 years from Krishna's advent, his being here, and 500 years from Lord Chaitanya, and only 40 years from when, when, when Prabhupada was here. Sometimes I, I, I think we were very lucky, the Prabhupada disciples, because we had both his Vapu and his Vani. And then I think the devotees who came after us in some ways were probably stronger devotees because with only the Vani there, they still could surrender completely to Srila Prabhupada and to Lord Krishna, to Lord Chaitanya, and to agree to carry on his mission. I know for Srila Prabhupada it was very important to him that the devotees, the Indian people also would become devotees. And now we see that so many have now taken to Krishna consciousness and are carrying on their culture that was given to them um, by Srila Prabhupada's mercy. Now if we can each be an emissary of Lord Chaitanya and go out and everyone we meet, because we are chanting Hare Krishna and because we uh, follow regulative principles, we have some degree of purity. We've been empowered by the Shaktivesha avatar. It took, it took uh, many years for Christ and his mission uh, of Christianity to take, to become empowered. And so we see it's taken a little bit of time for uh, Lord Chaitanya's mission to really start to spread and become empowered. But it's now beginning to happen. And if each of us goes out and we speak as much as possible the very words of Prabhupada um, and Lord Krishna from his books, then we also can bring some more people. Each person we bring, their families become. Someone just told me today that she came and then her parents who were inimical became fixed up devotees. Her mother had this glorious death. Her, her brothers are now chanting. Her sister's now a devotee as well. And their children and their and all their relatives are children. So you change one person's life and they're affecting so many generations of people that come after them. So we just must always remember that and feel very enlivened to be the emissary of Srila Prabhupada. Um, there's a story that, that Prabhupada gives that he told in one of his lectures where he um, is talking about Paramahamsas and how Paramahamsa is like a, like a swan. They're like swan-like men. They're like swan-like people. So graceful, so beautiful. They, they, they live in this world but not, be, uh, not of it, but also they just are so graceful in the way that they carry on their lives and that they are able to worship. And the, he goes on to sort of explain that the definition of a Paramahamsa is actually a soul who is no longer envious of anyone else. And so I suppose we can judge how close we are to being a Paramahamsa by how much envy we still have in our hearts. But anyway, he goes on to, to, to explain that and he said, you will find in India that there are, are lots of Paramahamsas and you may not recognize them, but they are present, in, especially in India. And then he looked at, at the devotees and he said, and he said, some of you may also become Paramahamsas. And he said, and the rest of you, you're just lucky ducks. <laughs> so I knew that I was a quack quack <laughs> in that story. So, um, and one of the things that he said was the very most difficult thing for us is to know who each other are. We don't know one to the other how great or how small uh, a soul we are in contact with. That includes animals, it includes everyone that we meet, people who are not devotees yet, but because if we can remember that everyone is actually a devotee at heart, they just haven't had the mercy yet.
of, of association, uh, you know, with Prabhupada or with the, with, the, with, the spiritual, with our spiritual knowledge or the chance to chant Hare Krishna, if we can always remember that. And, that we, and, and it's very clear that we must be very humble and also uh, very respectful of all souls, even if they aren't even devotees yet. So I think that will be a good way to serve Srila Prabhupada. So we'd like to thank Vidya Devi Dasi for taking us back to that very faithful moment 40 years ago yesterday and for also inspiring us to push on Srila Prabhupada's mission. So from men's side, anybody want to come? Haravapu or Sridhar? Okay, we'll ask Sridhar to come. and give his memories of Srila Prabhupada. I was very happy, he was, when I first joined in Vrindavan he was here, now I'm very happy to see him after many, many years. Vishnupadai Krishna Prasthai Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swami Tanami Namaste Saraswati Devi Janani Vishesha Shinivari Pascha Tade Satami Hare Krishna Vidya, that was uh, very moving. Uh, I've been very moved. I haven't, I haven't been in Vrindavan since 1989. And uh, Dinabandhu Prabhu, what you said yesterday. I, I was very moved by that. Dr. Churu Maharaj, his uh, very sweet singing of Yani Lo Prima Donna, uh, tears were shed. <laughs> so beautiful. And uh, I also joined in Gainesville in uh, 1970. Uh, then it was Krishna House, a very small um, little preaching center, Gargamuni Prabhu. And um, where I'm going, I'm going to a place where some of us were very fortunate to, you know, the time and place. Um, I was there when Srila Prabhupada cried once. Um, there is a tape uh, recording, there are probably a few, but I know of one on the appearance day of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Uh, Srila Prabhupada is speaking and he's speaking about the order of his spiritual master. And you can hear his voice breaking. So this is a hearing experience. His voice is breaking and um, I don't remember really verbatim what he said, but it was to the, to the, um, the, the uh, that I'm just trying to follow the order of my spiritual master and all of this is unfolding the way it is. And uh, I re one of my god brothers, uh, dear Krishna, He's, uh, he's now a sannyasi somewhere. He told me an instance in uh, Brooklyn Temple where he witnessed when the Didi curtains were opened, he was looking at Prabhupada, the bell is ringing, and he saw tears like syringes come out of Prabhupada's eyes when he saw Radha Govinda. And um, yeah, so. I remember, I, I think one of the, a really important word for the whole way of Prabhupada, one word, there are many words, but uh, it's, it's a mystical thing. As you were saying yesterday about the ecstasy, Prabhupada's ecstasy is in his purports. I mean, if you take a magnifying glass or a microscope and you can, you know, you could put that paper, you could put it under a microscope and you will just see you know, some particulate, what is it? But it is, it's a mystical transmission. It's a mystical transmission. And so it's, uh, you have the ink and paper, but there's something far more than, you know, of course the, the books are spiritual, but it is that sound vibration that 
has, there's a transmission principle that occurs and it, it goes into your heart. I, re, I was there, Shankar Shan Prabhu was saying yesterday about being 1971, the van is going to the airport <coughs> in Los Angeles. I was on that van. <laughs> and uh, we're going to the airport because there were so many features and, and uh, elements of Srila Prabhupada's being that were being exhibited in so many different ways, uh, little ones, and we were picking up, you know, let's just say, I hear different numbers, I hear 5,000, I hear 7,000, I hear 10,000, I hear different numbers for the total number of initiated, do you know? Do you know? 5,000 is the one that seems to come, 5,000 is the one that, that I think uh, Mahamaya has come up with. Yeah. Thousands. And amongst these thousands, you know, everyone, as uh, Dabi Shakti Prabhu and Vidyan, um, it's a personal thing. It's a personal thing. There, there would be 5,000 versions, in a sense, in a sense. Yeah, the GBC resolutions and, these, and Prabhupada's instructions, but it's how it sort of goes in and then how it gets expressed. Right? So at the airport, uh, and some of us, I know some of us have seen this. When Prabhupada would, co would come into the airport, you know, say so he was there, garlands, and he would start moving through the airport, right? It was a flow. It was, um, it looked effortless, but it was high speed, right? And, and I, I was there amongst the other devotees, and there were devotees jumping over the chairs, you know, Prabhupada's going down there, they're jumping over the chairs, those uh, velvet ropes that kind of cordon off. These were getting knocked over, and everyone is struggling to keep up, keep up with Prabhupada, but Prabhupada is just, he's just floating through at high speed, but it didn't look high speed, it just looked effortless. And, um, I think there was some, <laughs> some uh, response from the airport authorities about what we had done. And Prabhupada is sort of, you know, like, you know, you have to be considerate of these circumstances. Anyway, there was, um, I'll just get right to this story. So, in, uh, I traveled for a number of years with J Vishnu John Swami. After that, I was fortunate I got in the BBT Library Party in North America. Then I was in the BBT Library Party in India. So, you know, I'm pretty dumb. And uh, I just knew, Prabhupada likes books distributed. <laughs> See what I can do, how can I do that? So I got, on, I got on, this, uh, on these amazing parties. When I got on the party with Vishnu Jan Swami, it was like, yeah. I mean, you remember, it was just like magic. It was just purely amazing. So, we were in Dallas, and Vishnu Jan Swami used to dress the traveling Radha Krishna deities, uh, Radha Damodar, every day, and he did it marvelously. And, um, but Prabhupada is in Dallas, and we're in Dallas, and Vishnu Jan says, Shridhar, in a deep voice, Shridhar, you dress their lordships today. You dress their lordships today. I, go, I, I mean, I had dressed deities, but it was like, but Maharaj, Prabhupada is coming, you should dress them, you know. Now I'm going for a walk with Prabhupada. Okay, so the kitchen in that little bus, we had a devotee named Brikasanga. And he was, do you remember Brikasanga? He was, he was about that tall, but he was about that wide, and he was just all muscles. And he was a martial artist, you know, he, he had. Anyway, he would bathe the deities. And I think because he had the power and the strength, you know, they were just beautifully effulgent. But he would never clean up after himself. And there was a giant mess in the kitchen. You go, and you know, Prabhupada would sometimes, he would, he would go to the very place he so, please Prabhupada, don't go there, it's not right. <laughs> Boom, he's right there. <laughs> oh, who, is, who has done this? <laughs> so, the kitchen was a mess on the bus. Um, Everyone walks in behind Prabhupada, then Prabhupada sits down next to the deities, the deities open. And Ramacharya had found daffodils somewhere, and so daffodils were everywhere, so they're a very bright yellow flower. And uh, Prabhupada said, super excellent, right? So it's like, okay, okay, <laughs> please Prabhupada, do not go in the kitchen and look at the kitchen. <laughs> and he didn't. 
So, so we're very happy about that. So he's sitting down, right? He didn't go in the kitchen. So we're all sitting there. I was standing sort of next to the altar, next to the corridor. And Prabhat is there. And they bring Prabhat some prasadam or, you know, some things to hand out. And he's handing out, and there were fruit. And one of the, some of the fruit was strawberries. And some of the devotee women brought in their little children. And one of the little ch children goes, Prabhupada, you know, in a little child's voice. And Prabhupada goes, you know, he t immediately turns and says, oh, who is that child? And then, I'll say, that's Mohanananda's child, Srila Prabhupada. Mohanananda, red hair. Yep. Right. Uh, Gurukul education department. And uh, Prabhupada said, you know, bring him here. So he said, and the little child, strawberry. So Prabhupada says, of course, they go for the red. So Prabhupada gives him the strawberry. And then Prabhupada becomes very somber, very, very powerful, introspective mood overcomes Prabhupada. And he starts crying. Prabhupada starts crying. You can see tears gliding down his face. And he says, where is that rascal? Where is, where is that rascal? Mohanananda. Where is that rascal? And Prabhupada, some of the devotees said, oh, Srila Prabhupada, he's here, he's there. He said, you must go out. You must go out and find him and beg him, beg him to come back. And um, it was, uh, well, you can't really put these things into words, you know. Um, the whole thing is mystical, mystical potency. So, for myself, I've basically been exiled for about 30 years. I've been, <laughs> like the outer planets, like, Neptune and Pluto, I've been sort of orbiting ISKCON at a, at a great distance. But, so it's an interesting experience for me to come back after all these years and to see, and to see, to see the love. There's so much love here. And I heard the, you know, some of you, ISKCON, there's no bhakti. The, there is so much love here. Um, there is, um, so much sincerity and dedication. There uh, is such clarity. I saw Gopal Krishna Maharaj, and you know he's getting a lot older. And I was, I was saying, and then he spoke yesterday. He was so cogent and so it just comes out of him effortlessly. Beautiful um, elaboration of Krishna consciousness. And um, yeah, I've been I've been involved in doing about 30 years of psychotherapy with the calamities of our culture. And sort of off of what Vidya just said, um, you start digging into even the, the heart of a heroin addict and you're going to find something very beautiful there. You'll, and uh, I mean, many of us were in a very poor condition before we came to Christian Consciousness. So yeah, be merciful to one another, be kind to one another, uh, remember that we are all uh, just struggling with this human form. And um, always uh, do what you can to uh, follow Srila Prabhupada's instructions. So I'll stop there. Hare Krishna. So we'd like to thank Sridhar Maharaj, uh, Sridhar Prabhu, <laughs> as a different one. We want to thank him too <laughs> for some wonderful memories of Prabhupada's tears. I also remember one time. The Rathiatra, because it used to be only one Rathiatra that was in San Francisco, so we came out from from Boulder, Colorado, where I joined. And, but we knew that Prabhupada was in LA, so we went to LA first, because Prabhupada was going to San Francisco from Los Angeles. And we drove out, we arrived the day that the first time Prabhupada ordered that the Govinda prayers be sung at Darshanartik. I don't even remember what we did before, it's been so many years. I don't remember what we did. It was always Govinda prayers for so long, but there was a time there wasn't. But this was the first day, and in LA, it was in the old temple room where the Fate Museum is now. There was three altars, and Prabhupada paid his obeisances to Gornitai, 
took Charnamrit, paid his basins. I don't think even the big Radhakrishna, just little Radhakrishna were there. Then he paid his basins to Jagannath. And Jamuna was singing this beautiful Govindam Hari Purusham Tamaham Bajami. And Prabhupada went and he sat on his Vyasasan. And he was just moving his head so sweetly. And he was singing along with Jamuna. Govindam Hari Purusham Tamaham Bajami. And suddenly we saw streams of tears coming down Prabhupada's cheeks. Hmm? And we were all embarrassed that, you know, you don't want to know what, who we were, I could tell you about that, but that's for another day. But who are we to be in the presence of the pure devotee when he's experiencing ecstatic symptoms? We wanted to peel up the tiles of the floor and crawl underneath, you know, we were just so embarrassed. And probably the, 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 finally the tape ended, Prabhupada smeared his face like this and right into the mic he made a big sniff. I can't do it but very loud. And then at that particular time in history Prabhupada was teaching us Isopanishad. He just smeared the tears from his eyes, made a big sniff into the microphone and then just started chanting. Om Purnamara Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavashishyate That's reminding you of another pastime in L.A. I was there. And there was the old, old temple room, but there was a door where Prabhupada came in from his rooms in the back of the temple. And that time we didn't have the big Radhakrishna, we just had little Radhakrishna. And Prabhupada used to come, into the, come in that door, walk straight up to the uh, first altar, pay his obeisances to Gornitai, take Charnamrit. There was a marble column in between Gornitai and Radhakrishna. But as soon as Prabhupada walked in the door, he cocked his head back, like sometimes you see in the pictures, look like a swan gliding across a lake. He cocked his head back and he looked and he said, what is in Krishna's eye? And I've stood at that back door, because they were little brass deities. You know, now they're the arch, the uh, Mahotsa Vigraha, Utsa Vigraha. I've stood at that back door, I can't even see that Krishna has an eye, what to speak of what's in his eye. And as soon as Prabhupada walked in the door, he immediately cocked his head, said, what is in Krishna's eye? And even the Pujaris, they went, everyone ran to the altar. Even Pujaris, they were looking, they, could, they were right there, Prabhupada all the way from the back. He understood some things in Krishna's eye. Finally, they found a little piece of tilak had fallen into Krishna's eye. But from the very back, Prabhupada, what is in Krishna's eye? So, next I'd like to call wonderful God's sister named Anada to come and please give us some memories of Srila Prabhupada. She's always very inspiring to me because she's always very completely absorbed in meditating on the divine lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for your encouragement. I'll try and remember to do that. Um, um, I'd like to share uh, Srila Prabhupada's uh, visit to uh, London in 1977. Um, we had heard that um, some rumor that Srila Prabhupada might be leaving um, while we were in London and um, We knew that, that, that his departure was imminent and at that particular period we were following Srila Prabhupada where, as much as we could wherever he was going to try to get a glimpse of him and, and be in his presence. So um, we had decided to come to Vrindavan and then all of a sudden uh, it was um, 
around Vyasa Puja and Janmashtami time, um, we heard that Srila Prabhupada was coming to London. So, um, fast forward, uh, Srila Prabhupada arrived at Heathrow Airport. It was a typical rainy day. And um, he was wheeled in his wheelchair, um, either by Guru Kripa Maharaj, Tamal Krishna Maharaj was there as well, and um, the rest of the entourage was um, Pradumna, Arundhati, Shruti Rupa, and Abhiram, uh, and Upendra. So there were, there were seven of them, seven of Srila Prabhupada's uh, beloved sons and daughters accompanying him. Um, it was, it was a shock to see Srila Prabhupada the way we saw him. Uh, he had uh, sunglasses on. He was very gaunt. Uh, he had a gray chatter over him. Um, and basically, he was unrecognizable. We'd, we'd never seen Srila Prabhupada like that. And um, it didn't seem right. It didn't feel good at all. Um, but we offered our obeisances in the puddles and uh, Srila Prabhupada was taken to Bhaktivedanta Manor. We didn't make it back in time uh, to be at the beautiful darshan that the devotees told us that Prabhupada had had. But um, Prabhupada, would, uh, Prabhupada stayed in London at that time for about two weeks and uh, he would come, he would be brought down in a palanquin um, every day into the temple room and his palanquin would be put in front of uh, his Vyasa son and he would have a darshan of Radha Gokulananda and he would, he would sit, he would sit on the palanquin um, and then there was Guru Puja. Uh, Prabhupada wouldn't say a word. He, 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 would, he, he, just, he was brought down on his palanquin and he sat there in the, in the temple room the whole of the time. And um, basically it was a, a reciprocation, a silent reciprocation between Srila Prabhupada and the devotees, but not so silent, because um, Guru Puja was always the most, um, it was like transcendental fireworks without the pain or, or, or unpleasantness of fireworks, obviously, because it was um, uh, just a, a complete, uh, Prabhupada was giving his love to the devotees just, just by his presence. And the devotees were going wild. We were thinking, uh, you know, Prabhupada might be leaving, that that was in the air. And that whole disturbance of, you know, Prabhupada might be leaving, um, just conjured up this ocean of uh, devotion, of love between Prabhupada and his disciples and you couldn't tell where more was coming from. It, it was like a competition because Prabhupada was, was giving so much love and the devotees were just like, you know, to totally mesmerized by Srila Prabhupada. And there, there were a few, a few um, Little little personal things. We we would um, we would go out in the early hours of the morning. Uh, there was a, a lady, a very fortunate lady, that had a beautiful um, yard packed full of fortunate roses that made it around Srila Prabhupada's neck. <laughs> Their service garlanded Srila Prabhupada. 
because uh, we would go steal as many as were in bloom each morning and then come into the temple room and um, make little petal garlands for, for well, we'd make a, a petal garland for Srila Prabhupada and um, we, we would get some beautiful uh, roses from Ganga Mai's father's house uh, which he happily gave us permission to pick. They were very particularly fragrant and uh, Ganga would make a, a, gar a, a bouquet and uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj every morning he would wait for the, the garland and the bouquet and he, he would put the bouquet in Srila Prabhupada's hand and uh, Ganga remembered Prabhupada lifting, lifting the bouquet to his nose and, and taking in the fragrance of those beautiful British roses. Um, every, if, if Prabhupada made one gesture, like if he lifted his hand, the devotees would go wild and, and you know, it would just increase their ecstasy. And one, one thing for sure, the whole of the temple room was full of Krishna Prem, uh, Krishna Bhakti due to Prabhupada's presence. Um, I, I just wanted to um, to thank the devotees yesterday, in, in particular uh, our leaders, um, uh, Gopal Krishna Maharaj, Lokanath Maharaj, and um, Bhakti Charu Maharaj for um, refocusing us um, on the uh, or recentering us uh, at Srila Prabhupada as a, as a worldwide movement at Srila Prabhupada's lotus feet and encouraging all of us to take shelter <coughs> of his Vani because the, the statement that the Vani is more important than, than the Vapu um, is not an idle statement because by imbibing the Vani, that pure vibration, which is non different from Krishna, from Krishna's vibration, is non different from Krishna's flute. By imbibing that vibration um, and not tampering with it, not obstructing it in any way. Um, then the message of the Guru, Guru Parampara will be in full and pure force uh, at least for the next generation and then it's their responsibility to carry it on. But, but it's a very important thing that the... <clears throat> and, and no doubt that Lord Chaitanya will in, ensure it because as... Um, Badri Narayan Maharaj um, mentioned, Prabhupada said that this movement is going on due to Lord Chaitanya's mercy. Um, but it, it, is, it is very glorious when the disciples of the Shaktavesh avatar uh, carry on his message without any addition, subtraction or change because the message is perfect and it carries um, the seeds of perfection and the potency of perfection um, within, within the vibration. So I won't go on. I, I don't want to um, repeat what is already known. I, I wrote a little ode to you, Srila Prabhupada. Um, may I read it, please? Please. Thank you. Um, Majestic Master, Golden, sun-glowing, carried by Goloka's spirit, divine love bestowing. Soft as a rose, hard as a thunderbolt, plucking us from hell with a gentle jolt. May we soak, cleanse, and heal in your mercy pure from every form of confusion forever cured. May not the mad ele elephant vipers of mind and sense throw us into forgetfulness, dark and dense. 
If you are not pleased, our life is naught. May your pleasure be our only thought. To behold your radiant, charming smile shatters to pieces Maya's guile. The, the price is sheer simplicity, service disimbued of duplicity. Honest to ourselves, honest to you, casting aside all misgivings, sticking together like glue. United we stand, divided we fall. This truth is Sri Krishna's eternal call. Give up miserly weakness of heart, the message of joyful bhakti impart. An ocean of humanity lost at sea, pierced by quarrel and hypocrisy. Fallen in the grips of the age of Kali, tasered by constant misery. Nitai Gore have come again. They're, they're, they've shattered Maya's spell, spreading the rays of their benediction moon, enchanting all with their Hare Krishna tune. Kali's party is over. We thank you, Prabhupada, for that. Your pure determination knocked him flat. Holy principles back in place. You saved the three worlds, your divine grace. So again, I would like to thank all my god brothers, god sisters, god nieces, god nephews, for your association and love. And we all know that the basis and the genius of the Hare Krishna movement is that it is based on love and trust. And Srila Prabhupada is teaching us just that, how to love and trust, how to see the, the glory within each devotee and not just see some external facade or some social position or etiquette, but actually to see the devotee within each devotee and because that's what Prabhupada is teaching us to see. Um, through, through following his, his principles. So I, I beg and pray that um, our, our movement will become more and more what Srila Prabhupada wants it to be. And, and that will be as we all help each other become more and more what he wants us to be. And uh, again, I just can't thank, thank all of my God sisters and God brothers for inspiring me over the years with their, their cheerfulness and their, their um, single-mindedness. They're just completely... Uh, Stuck like glue to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, the founder Acharya of ISKCON and BBT. And um, there's just a couple of pastimes in, in London. All right. may, may. Uh, Prabhupada uh, mentioned that he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw the Vishnu Dutas coming, and they all had Cauc Caucasian features. <laughs> <laughs> had anyone heard that before? He, he had a dream, and, and the Vishnu Dutas had Caucasian features. And um, also, he, he, um, he was... Um, I, I don't know about here in Vrindavan at that time, but in, in London, he was... Um, he was being very um, overwhelmingly... Anything would make him start crying. The, the littlest thing would make him... He, his heart just was overwhelmed with, with love and he, he didn't... He wasn't holding it back. 
Um, so he, at, at one point he was talking about the, uh, the Indian government and how they were criticizing him for um, building a prashadam hall in Mayapur on agricultural land. So he started to cry and he said, uh, it's a nasty, nasty, nasty government. He said, I've given my health, my blood for, for uh, preaching Krishna consciousness and they're behaving in such a nasty way. Uh, this, this was at that time. Things have changed much since then. But th those were a couple of things I remember. Another thing was that he, he, um, he, he fainted one day and uh, Abhiram was his servant and, and Abhiram held him up and then brought him to his, his bed and later told Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you actually fainted. And Prabhupada said, no, no, I didn't. He, 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 he denied that he'd fainted. He, he was always so much wanted to be, um, you know, the fighting Prabhupada, uh, and, and he was, r right till the end where he was instructing us uh, to carry on with the basic principles and um, um, not ever neglect them. So the, the last thing is that um, uh, we, were, we were actually in Vrindavan two weeks before Srila Prabhupada left. Um, but we weren't really doing anything, so we decided to go to South India and then to Mayapur because Srila Prabhupada had um, mentioned that he, he, he had a desire to go to Mayapur, but we never heard that he said there might be a rival, but there won't be survival. So Prabhupada cancelled that, um, that plan. But we went off and then on the way back from South India, because the plan was to go to Mayapur in time for Prabhupada's arrival there. Uh, on the way back, uh, I was mentioning to Moksha Lakshmi the other day that um, we, had, uh, we, we were on the train when Prabhupada left. And we very much felt that moment because I remember distinctly we had got some flowers from the platform when the train had stopped and we had a picture of Srila Prabhupada on the little table by the window and we would put the flowers on, on, on the picture of Prabhupada and we were preaching to, some, to the people in the, that were sitting next to us and um, all of a sudden everything felt very sweet and, and different uh, and we felt Srila Prabhupada's presence. Then when we got to Calcutta um, we, we showered and we were reading Srimad Bhagavatam and my brother-in-law came in and told us, you know, your guru has, has, he used the word died. And we said, no, no, that's not, that's not possible. It must be another guru, you know, someone else's guru. Uh, so he said, no, no, it mentioned his name. He, he's, you know, he's gone. So we immediately raced down the road to the Calcutta Temple at Chorang, uh, Kamek Street, 3 Kamek Street, and uh, Srila Prabhupada's Vyasasan was full of roses. And I remember on the uh, racing there on the way thinking, well, who's, you know, we had a lot of questions we'd wanted to ask Srila Prabhupada. I remember thinking, well, you know, who's going to answer our questions? And then immediately, a voice came that it's all in, it's, it's all, a super soul was telling us that it's all in Srila Prabhupada's books. And as, as all of our senior devotees were mentioning Prabhupada's ecstasies, those ecstatic vibrations are in his books, particularly in his books, in his tapes, in his videos. So we're not bereft in any way. Vidya was just saying the other day, yesterday, that Prabhupada, or just today, that Prabhupada is as close, that, that nothing can, no one can get between each disciple and Srila Prabhupada. No biggie, no smallie. It's just 
it's up to each one of us to reciprocate and pray to reciprocate at every moment that, that love that Prabhupada is just holding, waiting, waiting for us to, to take at every moment. So I, I thank you very much for listening to my ramblings and um, pray your forgiveness for all of my offenses and uh, pray for your blessings that the day will come that we will chant without offense so that we can receive Prabhupada's pure mercy again. All oh, glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hari Hari Ba. Srila Prabhupada Ki. So we'd like to thank Anada Devi Dasi for her wonderful ramblings that took us back to Srila Prabhupada's last trip to the West and some other very beautiful realizations. And with that, we'll end this portion of Srila Prabhupada's Disappearance Day Festival. And we've just been informed. All right. We can have one more, no problem. It's Prasad is being served. That's the word that came to me from the temple authorities. So we'll call on Haravapu Prabhu to offer some memories of Srila Prabhupada. And that will conclude this portion. Thank you, Prabhu. I know it's late and uh, I'll be very quick, but uh, I'm from Hawaii and I'm sure some of you probably don't know a whole lot about uh, our Hawaii temple. Prabhupada loved it very dearly. It was like a tirtha. Uh, he would come there to translate and to rest and he would stay there for a pretty good period of time. So like our god sister was saying, the quack quack, the lucky duck, I felt like I was that because uh, my first temple I ever stepped into was a Hawaii temple and Prabhupada was there and it's a small temple and he would go on morning walks, uh, he'd come down and give class and it was like we were living in his house. It was very, very close association. Uh, there was Guru Kripa with the Namhata, they would come through, uh, Surabhir Swami who, helped, who designed this building uh, was visiting there quite often um, <clears throat> and Prabhupada was translating the fifth canto which uh, was quite uh, interesting because I joined because my first book was the easy journey to other planets and I thought they must be astral traveling and I was interested in that so when I got there Prabhupada was translating the description of the universe and also the hellish planets which scared me straight so I thought I'd better take this very seriously. So we went on beautiful morning walks. The beaches there are pristine and unimaginably beautiful. When Prabhupada was there, the sun and the moon, the stars, the beautiful wind, the ocean was increased a hundredfold. It was very, very ecstatic. Every morning when he'd get out <coughs> of his car, he would just look up at our temple and look around. And he would say, this is Vrindavan. So his arrivals were very, very majestic. I remember the Beatles, they had their guru, Maharishi, and you'd see pictures of him giving out flowers. But when Prabhupada came, it was so grand and majestic. Um, Shruti Kirti was his servant, and he was not proud, he was not greedy with Prabhupada. He gave each and every one of us that he could a chance to personally serve Prabhupada. And luckily, I happened to be one of those, and he wanted me to serve Prabhupada's fruit plate. In Hawaii, the weather is very beautiful there, so there was no need for halava and pancakes and all of that. He liked dab water, fruits, um, and that was pretty much what he would eat. Uh, he taught me a few lessons. On, I'd bring him the dab water, and he would tell me it had to be clear like water. And his pineapples had to be a little bit tart, not so sweet. Um, so one day we were all uh, having a big meal and we all got a little tired and sleepy. I think Prabhupada was the only one who was awake in the temple and he was a little bit disappointed. So he told Sruti Kirti, from now on when they finish their meal, go out and chant. So we would go out to Waikiki and we'd chant Hari Nam and it was with uh, Paramahansa Swami who was going to be his new secretary and Ambarish and other devotees, and we would go out and chant. I think uh, 
Yogananda was there with his Sikhs and I gave him a little card. I said, our spiritual master is here. And he had darshan with Prabhupada. Prabhupada was pleased. He said, yes, he's a, he's a good rascal. We also had uh, the Govinda's restaurant. If, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the first Govinda's restaurant in the movement. And he said, we should always have a restaurant there. And so he had uh, given some devotees uh, reign to run this restaurant, but they were mismanaging. And I remember I got to hear Prabhupada's first stern lessons. He asked them, he says, why aren't you giving money to the temple? And they says, well, Prabhupada, you know, we, we don't make that much money and, and you know, we were going to give some money. You know, he says, well, where do you live? He says, well, I live in this uh, condominium. And then he point to, it was Tarun Kunti and Revati Ramana. He says, so where do you live? He says, well, I live in a condo also. He says, well, why don't the two of you move into one condo and then with the other money for the condo you give it to the temple and they said oh Prabhupada we can't do that he says then you've stolen my restaurant and I want it back and so they sent me and a couple of other devotees to go into the kitchen and just kind of invade and take over and uh, so we flourished there and today it's kind of devolved into Govinda juices but we do have a little restaurant in our temple after every lecture <coughs> excuse me, that Prabhupada gave, after passing out cookies, his final lesson was chant and be happy. And it was so blissful. And I miss you so much, Prabhupada. All glories to the assembled Vaishnavas. Haribo. So we'd like to thank our dear God brother Haravapu for some wonderful memories of Hawaii. So now we'll conclude. And Prasad is ready. 3.30, group picture, family picture in front of... Krishna Balaram Mandir, Prabhupada's favorite temple.